The last couple episodes of the series brought us to the Miocene epoch, beginning roughly 23 million years ago. In this episode, we'll continue right to the end of that. Now, the geologic map of the world in late Miocene looks pretty much like it does today, especially now that South America has finally connected to North America. And that seemingly harmless event caused a few extinctions as invasive species from either continent traded back and forth. This is when, as I alluded last time, the giant terror birds discovered that they could neither defeat nor compete against a pack of wild dogs. That might also be what happened to the South American predator Thylacus smilus, one of the last non-marsupial metatherians who coincidentally disappeared at about this same time. You know, in the last episode, I mistakenly called this an Australian marsupial, and a few of you called me out on that, correcting me which tells me that my audience includes a bunch of nerds. So proud of that. We've come a long way in this series, both chronologically and morphologically. Most of the divisions and subdivisions we've seen thus far have not always, but usually followed a bifurcating pattern of cladogenesis, meaning that one lineage becomes two, and then four, and then eight, and 16, and so on, except for the ones that go extinct, of course. While there can be flowering branches at every node, that's not always evident. For most of our evolutionary history, one ever-branching lineage has survived when all or nearly all of our closest kin died out or were killed off. Except in the last several episodes, we've seen that more and more mammal groups are still around, though not the same ones, because life is quite plastic and genomes are constantly changing. Innumerable branches have withered to an eventual end at one time or another, and the few we have left are not the same species that were here then. But the parent categories are still represented, some of them anyway, if only by a dwindling few species, a fewer and fewer all the time in some cases, as we'll see in upcoming episodes. Then if only two or three species survive out of 16, they're most often quite distant from each other genetically and don't look much alike anymore, especially once all the intermediate forms are no longer there to compare. For example, if every other breed of domestic dog disappeared a long time ago and all we had left were dachshunds and Great Pyrenees and most people were never even aware of the intermediate breeds that there used to be, then it would be hard for some of them to remember just how closely related these two remaining breeds really are. Because if they're not interbreeding anymore, then folks would just call them Pyrenees and dachshunds and wouldn't think of them both as being dogs. And those who want to deny that these two had a common ancestor would probably demand to see fossils of a half dachshund, half dog. And that sounds silly because dachshunds are dogs, but it's just as ridiculous to demand fossils of an ape man, since men are still apes in the same way and for the same reason that dachshunds are a subset of dogs. In the last episode, we talked about the taxonomic family Hominidae, also known as the great apes, and we looked at the most primitive examples of that clan being the Pungids. And now we're gonna look at our own branch of the hominid family tree, a subset of Hominidae called Homininae. And once upon a time, that clade name referred only to African apes as opposed to Asian apes. But now it includes European apes as well. Yes, European apes. I'm not talking about the Barbary apes of Gibraltar, which are tailless macaques and not true apes. I'm talking about another genus known only from fossils whose range was once so vast that it connected the territories of African and Asian apes and included Mediterranean countries too such that there was once a variety of large apes living in what is now Spain. France and Hungary, and the climate was very different than it is now because these apes lived alongside r lions and rhinos and prehistoric proboscideans and crocodilians and other things that don't exist anymore anywhere, or if they do, you still wouldn't expect to see them in Europe. The Dryopithecus is a genus of dozens of Eurasian species, ranging from the size of orangutans to as big as gorillas, but they weren't orangs or gorillas yet they have been alternately classed as having a close affinity to both of those groups. And they are both groups, because there are still three species of orangutan in the Pongid group, and two species of gorillas in the hominin group, which also includes two distinct species of chimpanzees and one surviving species of human. There are more, of course, that are now extinct, and we'll get to those later. What the exact connection is between Dryopithecus and the other great apes is subject to some debate. Although most were about the size of chimpanzees, they didn't look much like chimpanzees. They were hind leg dominant, and some might even have been bipedal, but on all fours, they walked around on the flat of their hands like monkeys, not on their knuckles like gorillas and chimps, nor on their fists like orangs. Dryopithecus is a primitive genus compared to every other ape alive today. In some ways, they were more like generalized old world monkeys 
Some systematists include even the earliest apes, like proconsul, in that group. Others note that including basal forms would create a paraphyletic grouping, which is cladistically inconsistent, and proconsul is probably too primitive for the, even for this group, which is why others say that Dryopithecus technically refers to just one or perhaps a few different species of very limited distribution and only in Eurasia, with them and some of their closely related species being referred to as Dryopithecines. Even in this more restrictive classification, some of these Dryopithecines could be basal to living great apes. It's difficult to say, as we don't have their DNA, and jungle soil is highly acidic and consequently notoriously bad at preserving fossils. So it's easier to find fossil apes in Europe than in the tropics of sub-Saharan Africa or Southeast Asia, where two of these lineages have merged and where we know there have to be more of them. We do have some fossils, of course, like four species of proconsul in Kenya and Uganda to show that the first apes appeared in Africa by at least 23 million years ago. Then, by at least 16 million years ago, they had spread into Eurasia and diversified in both directions, giving rise to pungids in the east and dryopithecines mostly in the west. At that time, Europe was a subtropical paradise, enjoying a particularly warm, stable period called the Miocene Climactic Optimum. That climate changed 13 million years ago, correlated to the spread of vast grasslands, when organic material absorbed large amounts of CO2 out of the air and thus began a steady cooling trend of growing ice sheets. This resulted in another extinction event called the Middle Miocene Disruption. The effect on southern Europe was that the climate became much drier. And this is where we find most dryopithecines lasting until 7.2 million years ago. Remember that by this time, there were as yet no chimpanzees, nor even gorillas. The earliest proto-gorilla or gorilla ancestor known so far is Cororopithecus, who lived in Ethiopia 8 million years ago. And this would be long after the split from Dryopithecines and even after the split from our lineage, too. Geneticists and paleontologists estimate that our ancestry diverged from the lineage leading to gorillas 8 to 10 million years ago. And then a couple million years later, we also diverged from the lineage that would eventually lead to chimpanzees. Now, while there are a number of relatively dry anatomical specifics showing why fossil dryopis belong within hominin A, the single most definitive diagnostic trait of living hominins is that they have uniquely identifying fingerprints. So, if a crime had evidently been committed by either one of a few nearby gorillas or one of a few local chimpanzees or one of a few humans like yourself that were in that area at that time, we'd be able to fingerprint the lot of you to know which of you apes had his hands on the murder weapon. So if you don't understand your classification as a hominin, knowing already why you belong to all the parent clades that we already talked about, just look closely at your hands until you can figure out one more way to positively identify you as such.